Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And certainly, um, we want to welcome you to Austin on the far west side of Chicago. And of course, uh, the west side, which is the best side. Of course, the west side is where Dr. King lived in 1966. So all good things start on the west side. Dr. King lived here. Uh, for those of us who Christian, Jesus lives here. <laughs> and so we are welcoming you here today to the West Suburban Medical Center. And we also want to welcome you to the east side of Oak Park, one of the sides of Oak Park that has similar challenges to our neighbor in Austin, in which I live just two blocks from here. And of course, Austin at one time had the largest population of any community area in Chicago. And it still has a very high population of young people. And of course, this institution serves, in fact, is ranked number three in the state in maternal care. And so we're very proud of the work that this institution does in our community in helping bring forth a new generation that always represents hopefulness. But of course, this community, Austin, also leads in health challenges, health issues, COVID-19, HIV infection, sickle cell anemia, gynecologic cancer, and of course, mental health challenges as well, all of the things the stresses that come from poverty and racism are found here in Austin. Yet our health care providers struggle with inadequate reimbursements from the state and from other services that are provided in institutions like this. And so there you have it, a community of great needs, a community with a large young population, and also a community with inadequate resources for health care, a recipe for a public health disaster and tragedy. Dr. Martin, King, Martin Luther King said at one time, out of all of the inequities, injustice in health care just may be the most tragic and shocking and inhumane. And so our community needs a commitment, a commitment to an institution like this, West Suburban Medical Center, institutions like Loretto Hospital, and we support the demand for a moratorium on hospital closures, especially during this global pandemic, especially in black and brown communities. And so today, we want to make this right. We want the commitment made today that this community can depend on the services of this institution going forward. We deserve, we deserve the kind of attention and address and access to health care that are found in communities with more resources. You know, the Bible says, and it's a little difficult for a preacher to have a microphone and a crowd, because we've been preaching to empty pews during the pandemic. But the Bible says that the last shall be first. And it just simply means that when those who are on the margins, who are the most vulnerable, when their needs become central in public policy, that is when the kingdom of God arrives. And so as we've done unto the least of them, we do also unto God. And so this today, this work in these kinds of communities, the delivery of health care to the most vulnerable citizens, this is God's work. It is my pleasure to present my neighbor who I've known, now not that I'm anywhere near his age, uh, but I have known for probably over 40 years, who has been an incredible public servant, who served not only this community, but also serves obviously across the country as the congressman of the 7th Congressional District. 
And just as I live just two and a bl half blocks from here, he lives one block from here. And he is our friend and our neighbor. It is my pleasure to introduce the Congressman of the 7th Congressional District of Illinois, the one and only from Arkansas, Danny Kenyatta Davis. Thank you, thank you very much. And let me thank my neighbor for his very generous introduction. And if you walk across the street, you'll be in my driveway. And so it's good that you're right in the neighborhood where I live and work. I am so delighted to be here because I am here with both mayors from Oak Park. That is the current mayor and the outgoing mayor. And it's good to see them both. They've done outstanding work and continue to do outstanding work. I want to congratulate the Illinois General Assembly wholeheartedly, but especially do I want to congratulate the Illinois Black Legislative Caucus for the outstanding work that they have been doing. You're also in the home of State Senate President Don Herman, who is my state senator. And you're in the home almost of the Speaker of the House, <laughs> Emmanuel Chris Welch, the West Side Group. I don't know we've ever had anything like this before. And of course, the head of the Senate is, is, is none other than State Senator Kimberly Lightfoot. So the work that they have done is tremendous work, and I want to congratulate certainly my state representative, Camille Lilly, and State Senator Mattie Hunter as the co-chairs of this health pillars of that work. But you know, all the work that they do would be kind of almost irrelevant unless they could get it signed into law. And we are fortunate that in order for it to be signed into law, we have a tremendous governor who has worked alongside his lieutenant governor who's done an outstanding job, but our governor has had a steady hand and has navigated the state of Illinois through the corona pandemic. We are one of the best vaccinated states in the United States of America and that's because of his leadership. We are leading the country in criminal justice reform. That is because of his leadership. And so when people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from Illinois. We've had some great elected officials. I mean, we've had the first African-American woman elected to the Senate, Carol Mosley Braun. We've had the only African heritage president, Barack Obama, coming from the state of Illinois. And we've got the greatest governor in the United States of America, the Honorable <laughs> J.B. Pritzker. So, Mr. Governor, Thank you Thank very you. much, Danny. Wow. Let, let, let me just say to all of you, it's a daunting task ever to follow Congressman Danny Davis at an event. And I can't thank you enough for those very kind words. And um, he says them with this melodious, deep voice that I think we all know uh, and trust and have known and trusted for so many years. So, Congressman, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do for the state of Illinois in the Congress. You've been a leader on our behalf. And just as governor, I can tell you that uh, there's nobody that I know that works harder uh, for the interests of particularly the people who've been left out and left behind in our society uh, working for us in Washington, D.C. than Danny Davis, so thank you. Um, I also wanna recognize Pipeline President uh, Andre Soren for hosting us here at West Suburban Medical Center, as well as Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson. Uh, it's been my honor, of course, to stand with the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus as an advocate, as an ally, on each of their four major legislative pillars over the last year. 
uh, criminal justice, education and workforce development, uh, economic access, equity and opportunity, and of course, health equity. It's a testament to the people who are here with me today and many more outside of this room. It's a testament to the people who are here with me today and to many more outside the room that Illinois, despite the historic challenges of this pandemic, is making historic progress in tackling structural racism head on. Thanks to their exemplary leadership of the advocates, the legislators alike, Illinois is moving forward every single day to make the promise of this nation truly possible for all people. We owe so much to the bill's sponsors, to leader Maddie Hunter and to Representative Camille Lilly, to, of course, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, to Senate President Don Harmon, who is represented here today by his district director, Eileen Lynch, uh, to the Joint Black Caucus Chair, uh, who's here, Sonia Harper and Representative Lakeisha Collins, uh, to leader Kimberly Lightford, and I might say to all of you, so that you know, happy birthday, leader Lightford. We'll start singing shortly. <laughs> I, I'm just so proud of the work that she does in uh, Springfield and the partnership that she has offered. Uh, to Pastor Marshall Hatch, of course, to Dr. Audrey Tanksley, Voices uh, for Illinois Children, President Tasha Green Cruzette, uh, Illinois Community Health Workers Association President Letitia Boughton Price, and the association's senior program specialist, uh, Wendy Hernandez Gordon. For far too long, too many Illinoisans have been denied their right to quality, affordable health care. Whether through health care deserts, through inexcusable delays in Medicaid applications, through lack of geographic access, or through high premiums. The Illinois Health Care and Human Services Reform Act that we celebrate today takes sweeping action to address those inequities and obstacles, establishing new requirements for implicit medical bias training for all licensed medical professionals building out a community health worker certification and training program, increasing oversight and transparency around the Medicaid managed care program, and creating the Medicaid Business Opportunity Commission to ensure that programs uh, that the state embarks on reflect and support truly all communities of our state. Critically, this new law makes clear that health care is more than just about physical health. It does so by extending legal protections for people seeking help for an opioid overdose. It advances a commitment to strengthening the behavioral science, uh, sorry, the behavioral health workforce uh, so that our mental health infrastructure can meet the needs of more people. And it launches a study on violence as a public health issue so that we can ensure that our state dollars are best directed at ending crime and violence in our communities. The effects of COVID-19 demonstrate the need for healthcare transformation now more than ever. The pandemic has only heightened the urgency of more equitable healthcare access and delivery, particularly in black and brown communities and for those who are uninsured or underinsured. And I pledge to you to do everything in my power to make sure that the state of Illinois meets the needs of those who are being left out and left behind. So with that, I'm very proud to turn it over to a leader in state government who spends every single day infusing justice, equity, and opportunity into everything that we do, and that's Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. Juliana. Thank you, Governor Pritzker, for that kind introduction. In addition to your courageous leadership throughout this pandemic, I want to also thank you for your commitment to building a more equitable state. By signing all four of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus pillars, you are seeing the people behind the policy and valuing their worth. 
To the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, I am so proud of you and the pillars that you worked so hard to pass, which have now become law. And I especially want to congratulate the sponsors of the Healthcare and Human Services Reform Act leader, Maddie Hunter, and Representative Camille Lilly. Your love for the communities that you represent and communities all throughout the state is evident. The governor has already acknowledged uh, all of the other esteemed speakers, lawmakers, advocates, and those joining us today. So in the interest of time, I will simply say to all of our special guests, it's good to see you and thank you for your commitment to the work, especially wanting to acknowledge Congressman Davis as well as Senate Majority Leader Kimberly Lightford. Happy birthday. And to the administration and staff of West Suburban Medical Center, many of whom are in this room today, thank you for hosting us and for more than 100 years of serving this community. During the pandemic, you have stepped up even more. You have sacrificed a lot and put your own health on the line so that people can be healthy and feel their best. And for that, we are forever grateful. Racism is bad for your health. In fact, it was just last month that the Centers for Disease Control plainly stated that racism is a serious threat to the public's health. And that has been made abundantly clear during this COVID-19 pandemic with the glaring disparities amongst black, brown, and indigenous communities. These disparities, of course, aren't new. They just confirmed what we already knew to be true, that when we are more likely to contract COVID, be hospitalized with COVID, and die from COVID, it affects our mental and our physical health. When we face disproportionately high unemployment rates or paid pocket change for every dollar our white counterparts make, it affects our mental and physical health. When our children are expelled from school or suspended at higher rates than other students, it affects our mental and our physical health. When we can't live where we want to live or are forced to pay more for homes that don't gain in value, it affects our mental and our physical health. When there are no grocery stores or mental health clinics or green spaces in our neighborhoods, it affects our mental and physical health. And every time that we realize it's not just George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Dante Wright or Sandra Bland, but that the list goes on and on and on and on, it affects our mental and physical health. Racism in every form is bad for our mental and physical health. And that's why I'm particularly pleased that the Health Care and Human Services Act includes the creation of an anti-racism commission to identify and propose statewide policies to eliminate systemic racism. This makes Illinois a leader in something that is long overdue, being intentional about creating policies to dismantle systemic racism that has harmed so many BIPOC communities. And by doing so, the outcome will be healthier children, stronger families, and healed communities. Thank you again, Governor Pritzker, for signing House Bill 158 into law, and thank you to the Legislative Black Caucus for your leadership. I look forward to supporting the implementation efforts. It's now my honor to introduce one of the bill's architects, my state senator, Leader Maddie Hunter. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant and constituent. I am pleased to be here for the final press conference to illustrate the importance of the Black Caucus massive health care legislation. We have worked extremely hard on this measure, dating back to nearly a year before it was even signed. This was the final pillar of the Legislative Black Caucus plan to eradicate racism in the state of Illinois. And I am very, very excited to be here with the governor and the lieutenant governor and all the guests that are here today, especially my colleagues and all the providers that has worked so hard to help make today possible. When we are deciding what to, to when we were deciding what to include in this measure, House Bill 158, we had to look at all the areas in the healthcare industry that needed adjusting. We knew that there were many areas we wanted to address in this bill, including COVID-19, 
and other public health issues, community health workers, managed care organizations, some people call it MCOs, and the overall hospital reform. Though at times it was hard to find common, common ground policy-wise, I am so excited that we were able to evoke change in the areas mentioned above. One of the most noteworthy provisions in this legislation creates the Community Health Worker Certification and Reimbursement Act to establish a mechanism for the certification of community health workers. Community health workers are critical to improving individual and community health through their ability to build trust and relationships and deepen communication between patients and providers. Community health workers have a deep understanding of their communities through, life, through lived experiences, which makes them uniquely qualified to address social and behavioral determinants of health. Community health workers are also crucial in helping to address COVID-19 vaccine hesitation. Black communities in particular have a well-deserved distrust of the mainstream medical system. So, common, so community health workers who are from the communities they serve can help educate Illinoisans about the benefits of COVID-19 vaccine and help in this pandemic. More so, the overdose rate is at an all-time high. Black Illinoisans are twice as likely to die of an overdose and seven times more likely to go to the emergency room due to overdose, overdosing. A robust community worker program, community health worker program, can help reach those who have been left out in these communities and help prevent fatal overdose. Another area that's needed rectification was managed care organizations or MCOs. We wanted to make sure and to improve the outcomes of MCOs funded care with increased access to wellness care and alternative medicine such as napropathy, chiropractors, and other practices whose treatment may produce better outcomes for African Americans. That's why this act creates the Medicaid Managed Care Oversight Commission within healthcare and family services to evaluate the effectiveness of Illinois managed care programs and to address, to address inadequate levels of care coordination and care planning under MCOs. Additionally, this bill creates the managed care oversight fund as a special fund in the state treasury to be used by healthcare family services to support contracting with women and minority owned businesses as a part of healthcare family services business enterprise program requirements, better known as BEP. Because the current Medicaid managed care organizations are not meeting their minority business goals, the Medicaid Business Opportunity Commission will be created to develop a program to support and grow minority women and persons with disability-owned businesses. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, hospital and healthcare reform was urgently needed. We felt that in order to increase care coordination, management of chronic diseases, and addressing the social determinants of health, a program was necessary to encourage coordination between federally qualified health centers many people refer to them as FQACs, and hospitals including safety nets. Now more than ever, employees deserve more flexible sick leave benefits, which is why this legislation allows an employee to use personal sick leave benefits for a personal, for a personal care of a parent, mother-in-law, father-in-law, grandparent, or step-parent. Another area that, that needed immediate attention over the course of this pandemic was putting a halt to hospital closures. In particular, we included this clause to determine the needs of Mercy Hospital, which is in my district, which, and, and, and which announced that it would, which they have announced that they, they are not closing this spring, which is wonderful. 
Thankfully, that is not the case anymore, and we are continuing to work with stakeholders to find the best way to move forward for our effective constituents. The effect of closing a hospital are always devastating, even more so during the global pandemic. And in, in, in case of any other hospitals that are facing closure during this health crisis, this bill allows the Health Facilities and Services Review Board to grant a two-month stay on hospital closures. And although vaccinations are on the rise, this pandemic is not over yet. We wanted to ensure that N95 masks are provided to, to medical staff as appropriate to serve patients so that they are properly equipped to continue fighting this global virus and any other variants that may appear. Altogether, these acts are revolutionary and bring awareness to issues that have needed fixing for a long time. I thank the governor again for his support and making the Black Caucus agenda official. Now, I urge you, Governor, to help us ensure that these actions are fully implemented so that the livelihoods of all Illinoisans, no matter what race, gender, sexuality, ability, or socioeconomic status are fully supported. Health care is a right. If health, if, if health care is not centered on the needs of patients, then we are not serving the purpose or its true purpose. I have believed that my, in my entire life and have fought for legislation like this my entire career as a state legislator and and feel surreal to be able to see this kind of package come to fruition. I'd like to thank all of those involved and let's continue to reform the wellness of our state. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you my other half, the House, the House sponsor of this important measure, my colleague and my friend, Representative Camille Lilly. Representative Lilly. Thank you, Leader Hunter. It is my honor to co-chair the Health and Human Service Pillar for the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus with you. Uh, you are an awesome leader. If you don't have your health, you don't have much else. And I would like to say to Reverend Hatch, prayer works. We work together to make sure that we are addressing the needs of all people in the area of health care. I would like to thank everyone who joined us today, and I'd like to thank our hosts, um, Jim Garner and Barbara Martin, the president and CEO of the hospital here. Thank you for hosting us in the lobby. Um, we needed to do the social distancing, so we are here in a lobby that is greeting and making sure that we're providing access to the citizens of Austin and Oak Park. I would like to say thank you, Congressman Davis, who is a true visionary of healthcare in America. He's one of the co-authors of the Federally Qualified Health Centers, and he represents the most healthcare institutions in Illinois in his district, seven correctional districts. Thank you, Congressman Davis, for always being a leader and on point to have access to health care here in Illinois. I, too, want to thank Governor Fritzer for signing in this historical piece of legislation into law. Thank you for caring for all Illinoisans. You have made the difference. And as you always say, and now I'm going to say as we always say, Healthcare is a right, and yes, it is, for all Illinoisans. But we, again, it takes a team, and he has a fantastic young lady, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, who has been continuously committed to a teamwork, to, a teamwork approach to address the health needs of Illinoisans. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton. We are talking about the fourth and final pillar of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus policy agenda here in the state of Illinois. And it's to ensure that we all have 
access to health and human services. I would like to thank all involved. I would like to start with leader Senator Lightford for her entire list effort and I'm going to say whip to keep us moving in the direction <laughs> to get this done. <laughs> I would like to also thank all, each and every one of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus members who had the vision to put this omnibus bill together. And we have over, we have hundreds of pieces of legislation that is making a difference with this historical piece of legislation. But we couldn't have done it without our colleagues in the General Assembly. I would like to thank each and every one of the, the legislators who voted for HB 158. Thank you. We could not have done it without you. With the leadership of Speaker Welch, Speaker Madigan, and my president, or my senator and president, Senator Don Harmon, we put together a team of staff that made sure that this became to life, and we got it done. We passed it, we wrote it, we passed it, and we had our great governor sign it. We thank Danny, Allie, Ruth, and Patricia. We have, could not have gotten here without the staff. Again, HB 158 is an omnibus bill designed to address the continuous health inequities experiencing in poor black and brown communities throughout Illinois. We needed to take action to implement key reforms to make sure health and human service is, system is providing access and not continuing creating racial disparities. These racial disparities have caused lack of infrastructure and divestment that has a, caused issues with the basic essentials of life here in the state of Illinois. Education, food, housing, jobs, transportation, and of course, health care. And as stated and repeatedly reported, poor black, brown Illinoisans have faced these disparities for decades. And it has become undeniably apparent amidst this global pandemic. Life expectancy should not be determined by your zip code. The intent of HB 158 is to improve health outcomes in our black communities, in our poor communities, in our brown communities. That, have, that has drastically, uh, that will drastically reform the health care, health care and human service system here in Illinois. Study after study have shown that the health inequities experienced by blacks are the very core, are, excuse me, by blacks are at the very core of systematic racism. In 2021, during a worldwide pandemic, Illinois Health and Human Services has continued to perpetuate these health insurances. But this bill, this legislation signed by our governor will turn that around. It is so important to understand that HIV is one of our top five leading causes of death in the African American and Hispanic community. Black Americans suffer at higher rates of chronic diseases, including diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, asthma, and many cancers. Cardiac, cardiovascular disease, for example, is the leasing, leading cause of death among black residents here in the state of Illinois. Approximately 20% of African American and Hispanic adults in Illinois report four or more adverse childhood experiences, which is causing health outcomes to go in the wrong direction. Violence, you've heard, is a public health crisis. We must continuously address these issues through legislation and policy that allow us to work together to make sure we are capturing a health care system that is reducing racial inequities and racial injustices. And we here in the state of Illinois, our General Assembly has put forth an effort with this piece of legislation. And we do recognize that Illinois has a systematic racist, racism that has caused a good number of poor health outcomes to our citizens. 
this piece of legis legislation, again, will be addressing and reviewing all of these systems that are in place to ensure that we are ridding Illinois of systematic racism. It would create equitable access to comprehensive health care for diseases such as dementia, cancer, and sickle cell. The four programs that I'm going to highlight real briefly is the community health care worker infrastructure, and it's basically, as Senator Hunter indicated, the opportunity to change how we deliver health care services to our much-needed population, a vulnerable population, where we are providing navigation and coaching of how to help people navigate our health care system. Community health workers are making the difference because they are going to be reduce the barriers to transportation, medication, housing, and many of those issues that prevent all persons to have access to health care. We are we talking about in this bill a racial impact note where we are creating legislation and reviewing legislation upon the request of a, a, a colleague that will not have a devastating impact on a particular population here in the city, here in the state and in the city of Chicago. We're talking about moratoriums on health care clo hospital closures during a pandemic. Access to health care includes improving the quality of existing health care systems and creating legislation to accelerate house hospital reforms in the communities of color throughout our community, throughout our state. The Oversight Managed Care Commission, spoken by Senator Hunter, it creates an oversight commission to manage the organization, the managed care organization, to ensure that the standard of care are fulfilled for not only the patient, but also the provider. With this bill, this omnibus bill, it is not a complete fix to the problems caused by medical systematic racism, but is a significant step towards improving the quality of life of so many Illinoisans. This law provides changes in the areas that are not always a part of the first thought of health care and hospital reforms, but the purpose of this reform is to create comprehensive change for communities across Illinois where health care disparities are literally life or death. The fourth pillar addresses the essential, basic essential of one's life here. I like to acknowledge the work of many of us um, working together, such as Commissioner Johnson, Village President Vicki, and Village President Vicki Shaman, <laughs> and also Village President Anand. It is important that West Suburban Hospital and its board and its staff come along to make sure that we are ensuring access to health care. We are better together. With the leadership of leader Sonia Harper, who has put her heart, mind, and soul into the implementation of our four pillars, I want to thank you for your continued support and vision for what you know needs to happen. With that, again, Governor Pritzker, thank you. Thank you and your administration for all the hard work that you, I'm going to say, have designed uh, for, to be created in this monumental reform. We did not come to this place alone, and many conversations with the governor and his team has gotten us here. I thank you all for once again being a part of today and we look forward to seeing better health outcomes to all Illinoisans. With that, I'd like to bring forth, um, again, the leader of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, Leader Representative Sonia Hopper. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Representative Lilly. The Legislative Black Caucus is proud to be here today with Governor Pritzker, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, Congressman Davis, Representative Hernandez, Commissioner Johnson, and so many others 
to celebrate the signing of our health care and human services pillar as part of the Legislative Black Caucus's agenda to address systemic racism. I would especially like to thank Leader Maddie Hunter and Leader Camille Lilly, and especially Leader Lightfurt and the entire Healthcare and Human Services work group that worked so diligently over the past year to make this day possible. We believe, as you've heard here today, that access to quality health care is a right of all of our citizens deserve, and the extensive work done on this pillar, which calls for equity, change, and investment at every level of our health care system, will be felt for years to come. When we think about the health care needs of our black communities across the state and how many of them are located in food deserts and how many of us don't have proper access to quality health care services or specialists, even if you do have insurance, simply because of our zip code. We are dying sooner and living poorer quality of lives because of this. This inequity has led to the disproportionate rates of disease and illness and trauma that some have only shed a light on because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but which we have all known for years. Thanks to the work of the members of the Legislative Black Caucus, along with advocates, neighbors, and a host of many others, Perhaps in the near future, we will see people on the west sides and south sides of Chicago, as well as black communities across the state, have longer lifespans than they do now because of better access to quality care. The health care pillar joined several other of our pillars recently signed into law. They include our education and workforce development pillar, the economic access opportunity and equity pillar, as well as our pillar dedicated to criminal justice reform, violence reduction, and police accountability. Thank you again, Leader Hunter, Leader Lilly, Governor Pritzker, for this historic achievement, and now on to proper funding and implementation. Now I am pleased to introduce to you all Leader Kim Lightfoot, whose work and vision helped lead us to this historic achievement. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Harper. Good morning. I cannot think of a better place to spend my birthday than to be right here with all of you. Um, in lieu of time, I just want to thank everyone. Just thank everyone across the board for all of your work and involvement. Last year, when members of the black community and our allies rose up in unity, declaring enough is enough. My colleagues and I in Illinois, in the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, knew we had to cease this moment and come together in a meaningful and impactful way to enact real change. From the very beginning, I knew health care and human services would be a part of our agenda. The key point is that the quality of health care you receive should never be determined by your race, your income, or your address. Quality, affordable health care should be recognized as a right for all people. In addition, food security, housing, employment, education, and mental health concerns are all social detriments of health and of our daily life where the deck has been stacked against black Americans by systemic racism. Black people have been twice as likely to be infected with this killer pandemic, COVID-19. And as the world has been severely disrupted, this disparity revealed to us all that it is more difficult for black people to access quality, affordable care in addition to many other systemic problems facing our community. We knew that we had to increase our black residents' trust in Illinois' healthcare system, in addition to ensuring that it serves our community far better. The bottom line is that black families deserve equal access and the chance to be well like all others. We committed ourselves to undertaking real reform, recognizing that real reform will undo damaging policies and procedures that's built into our state system of law and government. 
we're also clear that we cannot change the century's old health care system or any system that oppresses us overnight. We can, however, start by addressing the constructs that afflict us piece by piece. The health and human services pillar of our agenda is the first step in fixing this broken system. As the chairman of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, at the time of developing the pillars, it was a vision that God gave me. I didn't know how we would get it done. I just remembered an omnibus bill that was done in 2000, 2001. And I thought that would be the best way to go because there were a number of issues that needed to be addressed. And I knew that we had to reshape the direction of our state's health care, leading with diversity, inclusion, and justice at the center. And I also knew we needed the leadership of State Senator Matter, Maddie Hunter and State Representative Camille Lilly. The Black Caucus in my 22 years have always fought for quality health care, always. And I knew that Senator Hunter has been a part of that fight for many years, as well as Representative Lilly having been fighting it since she arrived, and that the two of them would be the dynamite duo that we needed to address and discuss and shape the policy. So thank you ladies for a job well done. And of course, thank you Governor Pritzker for working alongside us and for supporting our historical efforts. And we know that it could not have been done without the support of our Lieutenant Governor, all of our staff that were involved in helping shape the pillars for the a black caucus to rid Illinois of systemic racism. So this law is the last piece of our four pillar agenda. It requires, it amended, and it created many areas of focus on issues that are not providing the services or yielding the results that it should. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not stop fighting until every single resident of Illinois is valued and protected equally. I'm proud that we have responded to these issues with informed policy, with the goal of deep, intense reform, and I vow to do more as these laws are implemented. Thank you very much. Yes, and it is my honor to introduce um, Eileen Lynch, um, President Harmon's um, office director. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm here on behalf of Sen Senate President Don Harmon, who is a lifelong Oak Parker and a uh, who, whose family has roots in the Austin community. So it is fitting that we be talking about a health care pillar in a pillar of our community. West Suburban Medical Center, thank you for hosting us. Um, I am here to emphatically and enthusiastically, but briefly, offer very strong thanks, recognition, and a commendation to, of course, our, the leaders of our state, Governor Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Stratton, but also, uh, on Senator, in, in Senator Harmon's name, uh, the leaders in the General Assembly, his partners. Uh, Senator Hunter joked about Representative Lilly as the other half on the health care side. She is the other half for Senator Harmon in the district, and Leader Lightford is his other half in Austin and Oak Park. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a humbling honor to thank them for all they did over the past year in leading the way on the uh, Illinois Black Caucus pillars. We look forward to working and moving forward on implementation. Uh, in my boss's word, he stands as a proud ally. He will continue to stand with and support the work. Uh, we all know that the work in Springfield is, is greatly informed, of course, strengthened and truly made real by what happens at the local level. So I wanna thank, as always, our partners Village President Skamen, Vicki Skamen, newly elected, and uh, outgoing Oak Park President Anand Abu Taleb, who's soon to become the, the chair of the West Suburban Board. 
So uh, thank you for all you do and all you gathered here for West Suburban. I want to continue on with our, uh, with our focus on local stakeholders as well by introducing Tasha Green Cruzet with the Voices for Illinois Children. Thank you all. Good afternoon. I am Tasha Green Cruzat, the Executive Director for Voices for Illinois Children, a statewide child advocacy organization. Governor Prisker, members of the legislature, and all of the guests here today, thank you. Thank you for your support of House Bill 158, but more importantly, thank you for your commitment to eliminating racial and ethnic disparities in our state. In particular, Thank you for the support of the Racial Impact Note Act contained in this legislation. This is an issue that Voices for Illinois Children and many of you in attendance have worked for for many years. The act will serve as a, me as a mechanism that will allow us to take a pause when needed to see if pending legislation may, may make existing disparities worse or hopefully eliminate them. Whether we will remove structural barriers with better health, housing, education, and economic opportunities, or raise those barriers even higher. It also does something else. It puts on record that the state of Illinois recognizes racial and ethnic disparities exist in this state. And rather than hiding those faults, we are ready to bring them out in the public and have a discussion about how to eliminate them. There is still more, more work ahead of us. We still need to fund the measures in this bill, as well as other pieces of this legislation put forward by the Legislative Black Caucus and approved by the General Assembly. We need to address those inequities that have widened during the pandemic and created so many hardships for so many people. But we are on our way. And Voices for Illinois Children remains committed to working with you to see that all children and all adults in this state have the resources they need for a healthy and successful life. I want to thank Governor Pritzker, the Illinois Black Caucus, and other members of the General Assembly. Thank you so much. And at this time, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Leticia Baton Price and Wandi Hernandez Gordy. Thank you. Leticia Bouton Price and my partner Wandi Hernandez Gordon. We want to thank our legislative champions, Senator Hunter, Representative Lilly, and our forever champion, uh, Representative Gable, and their staff for working to pass this historic legislation. And to Governor Prisker and his staff, and Lieutenant Governor Stratton, <laughs> for making and signing Public Act 102004. We're here today representing 400 plus members of the Illinois Community Health Workers Association, most of whom are African American, Latino, and Asian. We thank you for honoring our motto, nothing for us without us, and including ILTRA in the decision-making process which shaped the sustainability and growth of CHWs in Illinois. This past year and a half has illuminated the inequities felt by our black and brown communities for decades. This legislation says yes to a new day and further aligns the essence of community health workers, which is genuine care, support, and advocacy for the communities we come from and we serve. In closing, we invite community health workers, allies, and supporters from across the state to join us in ensuring our voices are at the table as Public Act 102004 moves from legislation to implementation. Gracias a Senator Hunter, a Representante Gable y a la Representante Lilly, al Senador Hunter y su personal por trabajar para apoyar esta propuesta historia y al Gobernador Prisker a su personal para firmar la ley 
Pública 1020004. Hoy estamos aquí representando más de 400 miembros de la Asociación Trabajadores de la Salud de la Comunidad de Illinois, la mayoría de los cuales son afroamericanos y también latinos. Tenemos un refrán que dice, nada para nosotros sin nosotros. Esta propuesta dice sí a un nuevo día y sí alinea aún más con los promotores de salud, que es el apoyo de la comunidad de que vivimos y servimos. Para terminar, yo invito a las promotoras de salud y a nuestros aliados que estén unidos con nosotros para garantizar que nuestras voces estén en la mesa. Y la ley propuesta 102.004 pase de la propuesta a hechos, porque señores y señoras, sí se puede y sí se hizo. Muchas gracias. And with that, please help me welcome Dr. Audrey Tanksley to the podium. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Audrey Tanksley, and I am a regional medical director at Access Community Health Network. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Illinois and grew up utilizing safety net clinics and hospitals for my own preventative and acute health needs. I'm also co-founder of the Bronzeville Healthcare Advocates, an organization of minority providers who fight for healthcare equity in the Bronzeville community and those that are demographically similar. Black and brown people have been plagued with racial disparities that while exacerbated by COVID-19, were long present as a result of systemic racism. As a community physician and advocate, there are many areas addressed in this legislation that help to highlight opportunities to combat these inequities. I would like to thank Governor Pritzker, Senator Maddie Hunter, and Representative Camille Lilly for their hard work and dedication in orchestrating and advocating reform for the residents of Illinois. The passing of this fourth pillar, focusing on health care reform, HB 158, is a positive step in achieving the equity of our patients and the, the things that they deserve. Um, as a physician, we know that medicine is a career hallmarked by the commitment to lifelong learning. And with this new legislation, we can warrant that the training of our providers that they're receiving is relevant and it's timely. Implicit biases involve associations outside of conscious awareness that lead to negative evaluations of a person because of irrelevant characteristics such as race and gender. A systematic review of the literature showed that healthcare professionals exhibit the same levels of implicit bias as the wider population. And this review concluded that there is a need to address the role of implicit bias in disparities in healthcare, and HB 158 does that. It provides provisions for immediate implicit bias training for nurses, physicians, and other health care providers. Having a culturally competent workforce improves the patient-provider relationship, which in turn improves outcomes of chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes, which disproportionately affect our low-income communities. Effective communication is a crucial area in addressing barriers that many of our patients encounter when navigating this large and very complex healthcare system. HB 158 creates the Community Health Worker Certification and Reimbursement Act, a critical step towards improving access to care and improving and building medical trust. Over my career, I've had the privilege to work with many talented community health care workers who provide care coordination for patients, assist with social determinants of health such as transportation and access to healthy foods, but even more substantially, they meet the individual where they are, help patients understand their disease processes, and empower them to self-sufficiency with the resources available to them in the community and the healthcare system at large. Many systems, like Access, have already incorporated community health workers in their daily workflows. And this legislation will allow for the workers to continue as integral members of our team and providing reimbursement for their important services they provide. 
Improving patients' health literacy is the first step in understanding how to best utilize the healthcare system, forming trust and strengthening relationships. We need this trust more than ever in Illinois, as we have all witnessed the unfortunate closure of at least three hospitals in the Chicagoland area since 2018, most of which served as safety net facilities. Safety net hospitals are a necessary part of the healthcare system and are approximately one fifth of the hospitals in Illinois. These hospitals face significant challenges and HB 158 addresses key areas of support needed by these entities. Providing a managed care oversight commission to evaluate the effectiveness of Illinois' managed care program, the largest payers for safety net facilities, will establish transparency. In addition, the bill creates the Medicaid Business Opportunity Commission, which will allow more minority, women, and people with disability-owned businesses to participate and grow in the healthcare industry. Industry. Finally, and undoubtedly most important to me, this bill amends the Illinois Health Facilities Planning Act and reforms the process for closing a hospital in the state of Illinois. The bill empowers the Health Facility Service Review Board to defer pending applications during the COVID-19 pandemic and encourages future applicants to analyze racial and health care disparities in the community they wish to build or break. I'd like to thank again Governor Pritzker, the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, and the entire legislature for upholding their responsibility to underserved communities. And with that, I'd like to bring to the uh, podium our esteemed Governor Pritzker to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanksley, and happy to take any questions from members of the media. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Oh, reluctant reporters. That's all right. Yes. We're looking at reopening all of the offices across the state of all of our agencies. They each have a schedule that they're working on. In particular, as you know, there have been literally physical threats uh, that have been brought upon the people who work in IDS, um, the line workers, as well as the managers there. And so we're working with uh, security advisors, we're working with our state police and so on to try to figure out how to do that safely. But um, as you know, the phone lines have been open. They are being responded to. Uh, people who are calling, not only that, but the people are being called back uh, in a reasonable period of time. We're working very uh, expeditiously to make sure that people can do uh, even Zoom type calls, video calls. Uh, so there's um, a lot of work that's been done short of opening those offices to make sure that we're being responsive to people who need to reach IDES. Kristen, you just gave us a timeline of late summer. Is that where your office is at with this? Yeah, I defer to her. That is certainly what the, the you know, the each agency is working on its own timeline and plan that we're, we'll approve or, or not at the governor's office. But... Uh, but as you know, all the agencies have been under the same thing. It's same for the city of Chicago, same for Oak Park, I'm sure. Um, just trying to deal with the, you know, the pandemic isn't over. And so we want to make sure that people who uh, are working there and people who want to come uh, into the government offices to talk to the workers there, uh, that everything is done in as safe a uh, manner as possible. Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody.